It is a, a pleasure to talk about two topics that interested uh, Jean-Marie Souriau a lot. First about uh, spinning particles. Before reminding you of the uh, very uh, nice uh, new viewpoint and uh, formalism of Souriau concerning spinning particles, let me remind you that uh, when most particles talk about the, the dynamics of spinning particles in special relativity, first, most people don't know about Soryo, I will come back uh, to that. And then they study the literature and, and they find uh, many uh, complicated and sometimes confused uh, works. In particular, the work of, uh, which is complicated but not confused, by uh, Anson and, and Redje, about the relativistic spherical top, which um, uses uh, a Lagrangian viewpoint. But what they mean by this is, and this is the, the problem, is that they start with four uh, degrees of freedom, the position in space-time for the particle, plus evidently the four velocities, so you have already a phase space with eight dimensions. And then to describe the spinning particle, they say that along the world line, you need to have a Lorentz frame. So you need uh, an element of the Lorentz group, lambda mu nu, to uh, define the angle. So you have six parameters. And then you have the, the rotational, the angular velocities, the time derivative along the world line of these six parameters which means uh, you have additional six. So it means you start with a phase space, if I dare to use this word, I know, of 20 dimensions. The, the Lagrangian approach of Anson and, and Regé consists of uh, saying what counts are not directly the angles, but the rotational velocities. So like the, the carton, uh, I mean, lambda minus one, lambda dot. Uh, and then they try to construct a class of Lagrangians depending on four different invariants. Uh, they introduce momenta associated with uh, positions and uh, angular velocities, uh, position derivatives. Then they say uh, there will be canonical Poisson brackets in this uh, 20 dimensional phase space. Uh, so they have these initial Poisson brackets. Uh, and then they need to reduce, because indeed everybody knows that the spin should have only two degrees of freedom and the phase space of two degrees of freedom. So you, you start from 12 and you have to eliminate 10, uh, essentially. And then also because uh, most people, when they speak about Hamiltonian dynamics, think Darbo theorem and canonical coordinates. You have to transform coordinates so to have something canonical. Uh, so all that, uh, you introduce Dirac brackets, so all that means a lot of work, uh, a lot of calculations, even in special relativity. And uh, by contrast, as you all know, I want to emphasize again that the approach of symplectic approach of Jean-Marie Souriau is both uh, con conceptually simple and technically economical. Uh, it is based on, on two ideas, the ideas of elementary systems, which by the way have changed a little bit of meaning over the works of uh, Soryo, but in that case it means that the Poincaré group acts transitively on the symplectic variety of the space of motions. Uh, and uh, it starts before going to the, uh, to the space of uh, motions by the space evolution space, which includes in the ordinary sense, uh, time, okay, lines. Uh, so you have a nine dimensional evolution space, which is minimal in the sense that you have four space time coordinates, x, and then at each point in space time, you have just two orthonormal vectors, uh, i, which will be a unit two unit orthogonal vectors, i, which will be uh, proportional to the momentum, and j, which will be the direction of the spin vector, the dual of the spin tensor. And, and then Soyo discovered that uh, and created the idea that 
the, the pre-symplectic form on this nine-dimensional evolution space uh, is given by this formula here, where evidently the first part dx dp is the usual part, and the Suryo part is the uh, yeah, I did not respect the Suryo notation here um, uh, because Carton anyway it, uh, had done uh, symplectic mechanics before with the Carton notation. By the way, there is a famous Carton uh, book in which he says, in my first paper, I denoted the, the D, what we call now the D of Carton, the derivative of a form, the D of a form as a prime. Uh, but uh, Kehler uh, noticed it was better to call it D, so I will adopt uh, D in the following. Uh, so, but the, the point here is the, the crucial point is that the spin degrees of freedom uh, are described by a, a phase space of a phase space of only two dimensions, which is indeed immediately the minimum uh, you need. First, I would like to discuss what I think is the conceptual origin of uh, Suryo's uh, approach. Uh, in the first paper of Suryo, uh, where he mentions this, he says, uh, soit j'ai un groupe de Lie, suivant une suggestion de Henri Bacri. And actually, this suggestion of Henri Bacri is a, it was a preprint of 1966, therefore before uh, Suryo's paper. Uh, called classical Hamiltonian formalism for spin. So the preprint was explicitly devoted to classical Hamiltonian formalism for spin, although for some reasons the published version was called with a different name, uh, space time and degrees of freedom of the elementary particle. And um, I assume you all know this, but for people who don't know, let me mention that indeed, although what Bakri, I mean, Bakri was uh, in Marseille like Soyo, they discussed, he had worked on spin already four years before. So all his life, uh, Bakri uh, worked around spin. And, and they published also together. And they published together, yes. There is a famous paper on, uh, on uh, the Falk and uh, company SO4 uh, symmetry group and things like that. Uh, uh, the point here is that uh, what Bakri does is not exactly what uh, Soyo was doing, but is uh, in a realm of ideas that at least suggested to Soyo this, because uh, he wants to talk about what are the basic characteristics of an elementary particle. He wants to say that the essential is to have uh, the Poincaré group as symmetry. To each generator, there is a conserved quantity, and then he wants the algebra of the conserved quantities, and then he defines uh, the 10-dimensional ten, ten space uh, of this quantity. I mean, what he's doing is uh, not very far uh, from what uh, Soyo uh, created later. And, but now, what is the origin of Bakri's approach? Actually, I think the origin is in quantum physics. And who is the person who introduced spin in quantum mechanics? This is uh, Pauli, 1927. So I thank the uh, organizers. For years I had wanted to read Pauli's paper, so preparing this lecture pushed me to go back and read many uh, papers, uh, including this one, Zur Quantum Mechanik der Magnetischen Electrons. By the way, there exists an English version you can find uh, on the web if you look uh, sufficiently. And, uh, and what is nice is that Pauli starts uh, from the uh, a classical Hamiltonian description of the spin, and what he says, which is not uh, totally evident if you open modern textbooks, is that evidently spin in classical mechanics is described by two pairs of canonical variables, S chi and S z phi. And uh, S is the, is the magnitude, uh, this is even written in, in there, the S is the total proper momentum of the electron, uh, total spin. And chi is the angle of rotation around the spin <coughs> axis, okay? But he immediately says that, anyway, he's interested in a system with fixed spin, and, and the angle uh, rotation will not appear in the observable, so we can totally forget about this canonical pair. And then the only other canonical pair which counts is Sz and phi, which means the z component of the spin uh, vector, and the canonical uh, phi associated. So what is this canonical phi? Uh, it is written, uh, uh, the cosine of phi uh, 
uh, is uh, SZ uh, divided by its length. So, uh, uh, sorry, yes, so it's written here. Uh, finally, as you can see by an easy calculation, phi is defined by this formula so that uh, the, the symplectic form for the spin degrees of freedom, d phi dsz, is, as you expect, simply if you say that sz is uh, cosine theta modulo the total magnitude, is the area of the uh, spin two sphere. So, so you see that in quantum mechanics, uh, indeed, Pauli uh, knew immediately that you needed two degrees of freedom. Uh, evidently, after this, for many years, people in quantum physics said this is fantastic. I mean, it introduces the Pauli matrices for non-relativistic spin, but relativistic spin is complicated. Then the Dirac equation came, and then uh, the analog was not done uh, at the time. Okay. Uh, and by the way, to end the story of Pauli, what he says then is that let's go to uh, Schrodinger representation. So the wave function. Uh, so we have only two canonical coordinates. And as, as you know, in quantum physics, the wave function will, be, will depend on only either Q or P. Okay? You have to polarize the phase space. And then he says, if you take that uh, the wave function psi is a function of phi, you have problem because you will have two valued functions. When he, he, he knew that if you do a two pi rotation, phi will change sign. And then he says, but it's enough to say that psi depends on the other conjugate variable, SZ, and this is the Pauli matrices. Anyway, what, uh, uh, even if it is maybe uh, not, uh, if it is sacrilegious, uh, I think uh, it is allowed to say that uh, I, I still, I would like to say that there are missed opportunities uh, in the beautiful work of uh, Suryo. Uh, first, the uh, idiosyncratic and uh, I must say opaque to non-Surists. I've, I've seen that some people um, uh, call Surists the aficionados of uh, Jean-Marie Suryo. So the idiosyncratic notation and style of Suryo had the uh, real effect of hiding his interesting results to most of the theoretical physics community. I think this is a, a fact. And, in, and this is in particular the case for the dynamics of spinning particles. And this is why I will, in the second part of my talk, mention all why it is important now to discuss the relativistic interactions, gravitational interaction of spinning particles and spinning objects. Uh, the work of Suryo is never cited and never used. And what people do is they say, they look around and they say, Anson Rege. And therefore, we start from a 20 dimensional phase space, and then we have to do all the Dirac uh, bracket technology, uh, which, by the way, is, uh, is fully correct. I mean, this is a way of reducing uh, the phase space to the one degrees of freedom you want. It's just it makes things more complicated, OK? So it's a kind of missed opportunity. I must say that personally, I, I heard about and I learned about the work of uh, Suryo, not from hearing a conference of him in 1970, uh, when was it, in, uh, in Italy, 75, uh, I think, where I did not understand uh, a thing, uh, but uh, from later work of uh, Bell, Louis Bell and, and Schuss Martin at the Institut Henri Poincaré, where they, they used it and uh, transformed this in a more usual language, and one could see uh, what it was about, okay? And uh, the Suryo uh, symplectic form, I have cited here the, the, the paper of uh, uh, Louis Bell and Schuss Martin. I would like also to say, although it's also sacrilegious maybe, to say that another missed opportunity is that. I mean, Suryo wrote Geometry and Relativity back in 1964. And he finished writing uh, A Structure des Systèmes Dynamiques in 1968. So it's immediately after uh, Genin. And it is surprising that he never tried or never said that it would be interesting to extend the spinning particle model, his model of special relativity, to general relativity. And I think this is caused by Suryo's disdain for the, uh, the symplectic potential, the Cartan one form. 
because each time he's saying, ah, the Carton 1 form is, uh, is not invariant, uh, why the symplectic form is invariant, which is true, but physicists are used to being invariant modulo a total derivative, and the Carton 1 form uh, is the action, okay? The action of Hamilton Lagrange, okay? And therefore, this is for most of physics uh, the interesting object to start with. Anyway, I think that as a consequence of that, the first person who uh, applied the uh, Suryo's idea uh, to the spinning particle uh, in general relativity was uh, Künstler in 1972, uh, which is, uh, and then it was later followed by uh, Suryo 74 and Duval uh, 76. So let me actually discuss what Künstler did in this um, nice paper. So the idea was to how to generalize uh, the simple, so let me remind you, the simple phase space, you have a point for position, you have a unit vector, which will be the direction of the momentum, and uh, in Suryo's, a unit vector, the minimum thing for the direction of the spin vector, okay? Uh, Künstler realized that if you want to have a, a closed uh, symplectic form, it is much simpler to start from a one form and take its D, evidently. Uh, and then, but the, the trick indeed, especially in general relativity, uh, the trick in that case is how well you need to introduce one coordinate more, one angle of rotation. So you need to complete the, the, the orth you need to complete the two vector i and j, which were orthogonal, uh, in a complete uh, orthonormal tetrad in space time, that is to say four orthogonal, four orthonormal vectors a unit in time and three in space, which here I have denoted I, J, uh, K, L. Uh, so it gives a 10-dimensional evolution space, one uh, more uh, dimension than for uh, special relativity. But it is very simple uh, to guess what is the good uh, one form. And, and this is what uh, Künstler discovered. You, uh, and, and a way to guess it, if you want, is that if you couple it also to electromagnetism, you know for electromagnetism that you need a mu dx mu in the one form, which is not gauge invariant. Uh, uh, and you have the analog that you have something, uh, and it is in the, in the symplectic form, there will be the d of a, which is the gauge invariant f mu nu. Uh, in the same way here, you need something at the level of the connection and then there will be the curvature in the symplectic two form. So anyway, the term, extra term, is simply the spin times the uh, component of the connection one form, uh, the ricci carton connection uh, one form, projected along the direction KL, which are the, the two other axes. So it means after duality, if you want, it is the same as taking uh, indeed S dot uh, omega uh, in space, okay? And also, when you uh, introduce, uh, like uh, in the BMT uh, equation, uh, a coupling, uh, a magnetic moment for the electron, uh, the mass which appears has to be augmented by a term one half of mu, uh, s mu nu dot f mu nu. Uh, then from this thing, uh, here I took from the paper of uh, Suryo, if you take the, the D of this Künstler, and uh, Künstler write uh, the symplectic form, but not in this form, which is now the notation of Suryo. So this is the symplectic uh, two form. Uh, and I guess the reason uh, that Suryo did not immediately find it is that indeed, starting from the Suryo uh, special relativity thing, you need to do several things to put covariant uh, differentials and to put an extra curvature term. Okay, uh, why uh, the action here of Künstler is simpler. By the way, I would be interested, as I have seen that there are many discussions by uh, Suryo, by Duval, uh, by Künstler, of the question uh, of what is the good functional relation between the mass of a uh, magnetic, I mean, uh, an electron with a magnetic moment mu as a function of uh, S dot B, let's say, in ordinary physics uh, units, which is S mu nu, uh, F mu nu. Uh, whether it has to be linear or it is the square of the mass which should be linear if uh, there is uh, some good reasons to prefer one uh, on the other, I would be happy 
to, to know what is going on here. Should be. Yes, I should say also, again, sacrilegious, that both the paper of Künstler and of Suryo, I must say, when I first read them, I could not understand the thing, nearly. In Künstler, I could still understand the equations better, because at least they were written in carton notation. But you have this big paragraph saying at the beginning, uh, you have to start with the principal bundle of Lorentz frames and things like that, and you don't see immediately uh, all the ideas are there, but there is like, a, you know, a, a cloud of technicity that hides the simplicity of the thing. And also in the paper of Suryo, the fact that you see the mind of Suryo wanting to put everything in a big scheme, and so uh, figure one is, is this, but it does not help to understand really what he's doing. So now this was uh, to connect with and, and explain why it technically uh, what I really think is a, a very nice uh, and very useful uh, idea of Suryo has not been used uh, in the current literature, although myself I publicized it, I told. It is cited sometimes because I told people, but you know, <laughs> uh, the literature of spinning particle is very confusing, but if you read Künstler, uh, uh, you will find, I don't, I'm sorry, I cannot tell them read Suryo because, uh, anyway, why is, uh, because people would not understand uh, I can understand now, uh, it took me time. Uh, so why are we interested in the gravitational interaction of spinning bodies? Because, as you all heard, uh, LIGO and Virgo have detected the coalescing sys binary systems of two compact spinning objects, at the beginning uh, spinning black holes and also uh, spinning neutron stars, and you want you want to solve the dynamics of two, so this is a space-time picture here, where you have two, let's say, black holes going around in space-time, interacting, emitting gravitational waves. You have to solve Einstein equations, and you compute a gauge invariant quantity, which is the waveform emitted by the, the coalescence as seen at infinity. Okay. Now, many tools of physics and mathematics have been used and uh, have allowed uh, physicists to predict the gravitational wave signals from coalescing binary black holes. I will mention just a few of them, like uh, match asymptotic expansion methods, post-Newtonian approximation. Post-Newtonian means uh, ex non-relativistic expansion, uh, but beyond Newton, you know, in powers of V over C, or V square over C square. Uh, this has been pushed up to what is called four loops in the QFT, quantum field theory language. Uh, recently, post-Minkowskian approximation theory uh, has become important. I will mention uh, this. Then uh, the computation of the wave emission by matching uh, multipolar post-Minkowskian and post-Newtonian. I will mention the effective one-body approach, quickly self-force, and numerical relativity which uh, is, has been combined with analytical methods to improve uh, the result. Why do we need an analytical description of the waveform? It's because the waveform, when the gravitational wave passes on Earth, the, 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 the waveform is, is, uh, is lost in the broadband noise. I mean, you cannot see it in the, in the full signal. It is, uh, you know, uh, uh, 40 times smaller than the broadband noise. So you need a technique to be able to extract it from the noisy output of the detectors. And this technique, this is match filtering, which means that if you know, like here, the, the, the shape of the gravitational wave signal you look for, you can essentially correlate uh, the noisy output with this and find if this signal is lost. But for this, you need to know the signal for all possible values of masses, the masses of the two bodies, and spins. Because a priori, it was expected astrophysically that black holes would be spinning with maxim near maximum spin, you know, very high spin, possibly spins in any uh, direction. So you have the full uh, phase space of two masses and two spins with all their angles, okay? Actually, all the observations are compatible with nearly zero spin, so it's not so urgent to have the maximum spin uh, formulas uh, all correct. But still, in the future, certainly one will observe highly spinning black holes. So 
many approximation methods has, have been used. And at the end, I will go to the idea that uh, uh, quantum field theory and string theory has also, uh, is now currently uh, quite useful. But let us start with just discussing quickly uh, the problems. Okay. One, the basic problem is we are not talking about test particles. You know, we are not talking, uh, we are talking about black holes, which are the most strongly self-gravitating objects in the universe, which means they deform the geometry near, their, near the, where they are. They deform the geometry of space-time by 100%. So you cannot say it's a small deformation of flat uh, space-time, okay? So to be able to deal with this, uh, you need a technique called match asymptotic expansion, uh, which was justified uh, in the 80s, uh, which means you combine two different approximation schemes, one near the black hole and one far from the two black holes. But this scheme, although conceptually it's very clear, it's technically very demanding. And therefore, what is very useful is to prove another thing, which is called skeletonization. Uh, which is the idea that you can actually, for all practical purposes, replace a black hole, which is you know complicated uh, structure, by a point particle with spin. Okay, so uh, it's a world line in a space-time that you have to construct. Along the world line, you will have a momentum, you will have a spin vector, and you make two of these. And then starting from this, which looks like an absurd point of view for black holes, you want to construct the interaction of the two black holes, starting with uh, basic results done by Mathison uh, in Poland in 1931, uh, which essentially means you describe these point particles by delta functions and derivative of delta functions when you have the spin. And uh, this looks uh, absurd, but it has been shown in the 80s that there exists an so-called effacing principle, which modulo some technicalities, uh, allow you indeed to work in generativity with point particles. But the price is that you need to introduce techniques from quantum field theory, like dimensional regularization. So essentially, you do all the calculations by perturbation theory in a space-time of dimension four plus epsilon, where epsilon is a complex number, when epsilon is different from zero, the calculations are well defined. Don't laugh. The calculations are well defined. And at the end of the calculation, you take an IT continuation, <coughs> epsilon down to zero. And it was proven that up to five loop, the result will be finite. And indeed, it is finite. And it was proven that it is equal to what you want which is the most important thing, not only being finite, but uh, equal to what you would have done if you had solved the more complicated problem of the two black holes. Now, to do that, one way is to start from the full action for gravity and the two-point particles. So you have an action, which is the action for two uh, point masses, the Einstein-Hilbert action for gravity, a gauge-fixing term, and then you want to eliminate, uh, as it's called in QFT, uh, integrate out the gravitational field. The gravitational field essentially uh, will, um, will generate you know, a gravitational potential, a gravitational force, and a gravitational interaction energy between the two world lines. So you integrate out the gravitational field, uh, and you replace, and you prove, this was first proven in electromagnetism by uh, Fokker in 1929, that if you replace in the complete action uh, the metric by solving Einstein equation in presence of two given world lines, the action you obtain, which does not contain the gravitational field anymore, but contains two world lines interacting via something, uh, is the good action that when you minimize it, describe the dynamics of the two black holes. So what you do is perturbation theory. So you, you, um, you take the metric G, here I have suppressed the indices, okay? Equal eta mu nu, the Minkowski metric, plus h mu nu, but you don't work to linear order, you work to all orders in h mu nu. You replace uh, the action contains term quadratic, cubic, quartic, quintic, etc. in h, and coupling to t. You solve Einstein's equation in some gauge 
uh, in terms of the t mu nu of the matter. So now you replace you know, h mu nu as an integral uh, over the two word lines, and then you insert. And this gives rise to a representation of the dynamics where the first term would be called the one graviton exchange. It means linearized gravity potential between two world lines. Uh, then you have terms that contain the cubic vertex of Einstein equation, which means you take into account nonlinear <laughs> terms in Einstein equations and non nonlinear. And this was done up to four loops, because you see there are four loops in this thing. When you do that, because you have replaced the extended objects by point particles, you have infinities. That is to say, it's very easy to understand why, because one of the simplest uh, calculations is to say, I have a world line, which means it is a point mass. This point mass generates a gravitational field, and I need to compute the value of the gravitational field, gravitational potential, on the position where the world line is, among other things. But evidently, this is a 1 over r potential near the particle, and then it means computing 1 over r at r equals 0. So you get infinities. No problem. Uh, if you are in a dimension 4 minus epsilon, the answer is 0 instead of being infinite. It looks like a joke, but it is not. Okay, there is the whole theory of renormalization, classical renormalization, introduced by Dirac in 1938. And technically, it is well understood that this is just a way to compute physical effects, you know? It's just a fast way. By the way, there are also infinite divergences that have been understood at, at four loops, but I will not enter into that. So at the end of the day, or at least at the end of 20 years of work, you get uh, equations of motion uh, and an Hamiltonian. Uh, I don't discuss here how you introduce radiation reaction in the problem for simplicity. So let me discuss the conservative part of the dynamics, the part which is due to uh, time symmetric interaction uh, between two massive bodies. Uh, the first uh, correction in v square over c square beyond Newton has been obtained by Einstein and Feldman in 1938. Actually, it was obtained before by Lorentz and Dross, but again, everybody forgot this paper published in a, in a Dutch journal in Dutch, uh, no, maybe in English, I forgot, and this was totally ignored for 20 years. And the first calculations beyond V4 over C, I mean, was done in the 80s, and then V6 over C6 in 2000. And then uh, it's only uh, uh, a few years ago that uh, one could go to the fourth approximation, which means eighth order in V over C. Uh, and, and this is done not as a joke, you know, saying we have nothing to do, we want to do complicated calculations, but because they are uh, useful. What I want to mention here, the, 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 most of the work and the most precise work has been done on the interaction of point masses without spins, okay? But now it is, and people have, and I will now start men, uh, discussing in detail, the inclusion of spin-dependent effects. So what, what does this diagram mean? This diagram means, look at this. Uh, here, can you see this? Uh, there is T, which means T mu nu, G means Green's function, and T mu nu. So this is an integral where you have the T mu nu, which is uh, a distribution along world line, and uh, it interacts by the Green's function, which means 1 over R potential, in the, if we were non-relativistic, the other thing. So this is like the 1 over R potential between two masses. At the next order, you have something like that. V cube, which means cubic vertex, GT, 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 which means that each particle creates a gravitational field, but now you need to take, a, that's the answer to your question, there exists energy in between. Einstein equations are nonlinear, which means the, the energy, mass energy, which creates gravity is not only on the world line, but also in the field. But this is taken into account by Einstein's cubic vertex and then quartic, etc. You take into account all the nonlinearity of Einstein, then you can use words like mass or whatever, but at the end, this is invariant. You take into account all effects, uh, including uh, self mass of the object and uh, the energy, E equal mc squared. So gravity also, the gravitational field has energy and it gravitates.
Actually, the post-Newtonian expansion by itself is not uh, convergent because of domain of dependence uh, thing. Uh, but what you want uh, are uh, asymptotic expansions, okay? And now, I will, next, I will discuss the problem that these expansions uh, lose their uh, convergent properties in the practical sense, in the sense they become very bad uh, before uh, the end of the... Uh, of the motion of the two black holes, so you need to do something else. And that's what I discuss now. So, uh, so these are just to show you that this is the Hamiltonian at uh, Newtonian, post-Newtonian, at the uh, V4, uh, V6 over C6 order, and you have hundreds of terms when you go to the uh, four uh, post-Newtonian order and something non-local in time. The problem of these complicated expansions, the one we just saw, is that first they are complicated. So if you have an Hamiltonian which has 100 terms, it's not good okay, to discuss the dynamics of two bodies. Okay? And also that when you look at de in detail, you find that this thing, uh, actually, uh, these post neutron expansions, they become practically very bad uh, when the bodies are still not touching each other. Okay? And the way you see it, is uh, if you compute uh, gauge invariant quantities, you have an expansion which is like 1 plus epsilon plus epsilon square, but at uh, even before they touch, epsilon is 1, actually. You find it's 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1. The series does not converge in a practical sense, okay? Therefore, you need something else, which physicists call resummation, which just means you need something else which is better behaved. And uh, this is what we invented, 15, 20 years ago now, nearly, uh, which is called the effective one-body method. I will not describe it in, in full detail, but the idea is you replace bad expansions by a better uh, way of uh, uh, writing the thing, completely different, and then this allowed the first, actually, prediction of what is the full dynamics up to merger and what is the full gravitational signal, including merger. Let me give you an idea of what is uh, this uh, effective one body. First, why is it called effective one body? Because you start with the motion, the dynamics of two bodies. So the Hamiltonian initially depends on the position uh, and momenta of two bodies, okay? Uh, and it is given by a, a series of diagrams. Uh, ah, by the way, just for uh, historical reasons. These uh, would now be called Feynman diagrams, and they are Feynman diagrams in a classical context, which means you concatenate Green's function, vertices, and uh, interaction with sources, except that the idea of these diagrams were, was already contained in the paper of 1929 of Fokker, which was the topic of the uh, thesis work of Feynman. So it is clear that Feynman got the idea of this uh, diagram from Fokker, and now we are back to classical Fokker type action for gravity. Anyway, on the left hand side, you have this complicated Hamiltonian given as a perturbation theory. And now what you want to say is this two body Hamiltonian, I want to say is equivalent to the dynamics, essentially the geodesic dynamics of a particle of mass mu, where mu is the usual old, you know, Newtonian effective mass, m1, m2 divided by the sum of the two masses but this relativistic particle of mass mu moving in some effective metric, g mu nu effective, which means that it will have a mass shell condition or an Hamilton-Jacobi equation of the following type, you know, g mu nu, p mu, p nu, okay? And uh, plus mu square, plus the mass of the object. And then it was discovered that one needs to add corrections which are non-quadratic in momenta. I will discuss that in a moment. But the basic idea <coughs> is that in some approximation, you want to replace the two-body problem by one body moving in some external metric. But you don't know the external metric. So you have to construct it. And the, the property of this method is it gives you method to compute what is this effective metric. Uh, and uh, let me not discuss how it is done. So uh, at the end, uh, instead of a complicated Hamiltonian, for instance, this is the full Hamiltonian at the third post neutron approximation, which has like 50 terms. This is equivalent to much simpler equations, which is the following. You say that you have a particle 
which moves in an effective metric which is spherically symmetric and a spherically symmetric metric is described by the coefficient of dt square, let's call it a, okay, if it, uh, and the coefficient of dr square, let's call it b, and the values of a and b are uh, in, uh, f expressed as a function of gm over r, okay, uh, if what you know in advance is that if one of the two masses was much smaller than the other one, evidently you would have to describe the particle as a test particle moving in the field of a big mass, which is a Schwarzschild metric if it is non-spinning, okay? And therefore this metric has to reduce to the Schwarzschild metric, which means for instance that G00, the A function, has to reduce to 1 minus 2 gm over c square r, and therefore 1 minus 2u. So you see the corrections beyond uh, Schwarzschild are given by this term. But they are very simple. There is like 2 new u cube. So uh, there are no corrections at the 1pn approximation. So the complicated einstein hilfeld hoffmann thing is disappeared completely. It's equivalent to Schwarzschild. The next order, which has already 20 uh, coefficients, is equivalent to having a coefficient 2 here and a coefficient 6 here. And at the complicated 3pn level, the coefficient contains pi square, but it is one coefficient, one coefficient, <coughs> and a term in pair. So just to give you the idea that it is a way to compress its equivalent. It has the same gauge invariant information. And in reality, the, the, what is the technically most useful here is that you use the power of uh, Hamiltonian mechanics, which means you do not only coordinate transformation, but canonical transformation. You change, you know, both uh, Qs and Ps, and this allows a much bigger group. Anyway, let me now come back to end with the, the long and confused uh, history of the motion of spinning bodies in general relativity. As I said, it started with uh, Matheson, then uh, many classic works are by uh, Papa Petru, Pirani, Tulchev. No? Tulchev is around. Uh, and uh, in special relativity, it started with uh, Thomas Frankel, uh, many people, uh, Anton Rajay. Uh, uh, then, uh, for, for a long time, this work was a little bit academic, you know, why uh, general relativity in spinning particles. And then it became important, first when the binary pulsar was discovered, because we had now compact object, spinning object, and one needed to describe really its motion. And, and the new motivation comes from gravitational wave observations, where indeed you have the interaction of two spinning black holes. So <coughs> you want, and, and then many recent work uh, have been uh, dealing with spinning things, but none of this work uh, ever uh, used or cite, except my paper, uh, the work of Soryu, just to because of what I said before, that it was uh, hidden uh, in his notation and, and his book, which is a bit of a pity. Uh, now, let me just remind you of, uh, <coughs> as I said, you described the two. Uh, so uh, here I'm saying uh, you want at the end uh, an Hamiltonian formalism, which means some symplectic structure and things like that. But first, you want equations of motion, and uh, so you can start without saying what are the phase space and the canonical form. Uh, you want to describe what is the stress energy tensor along two word lines and the definition by Matheson of a, a spinning uh, particle model is something which has a delta function uh, distribution which represents the mass, the momentum, and something which is the derivative of a delta function, the first term after, which is the spin, okay? And then from this you get the Matheson, Papa Petru, Tulchev, Dixon uh, equations of motion, variation of the spin and uh, of the momentum. And then you have the issue of how uh, you need a spin supplementary condition. So, uh, so what is the problem? When you do that, the technical problems is that, as I already mentioned, uh, you start usually with 12 uh, phase space spin variables and you want to go down to two. <coughs> So you need complicated technology and transformations, Dirac brackets and all that. Why, if you had started from two initially, you would, it would not have solved all the problems, by the way, but still it would have avoided uh, some things. Uh, I want to mention also that there are problems, not problems, but issues linked with the use of a covariant spin supplementary conditions. Uh, uh, if you want now a very convenient formalism 
where uh, many of the calculations of the interaction of two black holes have been done is the uh, arnovit deser misner or ADM uh, Hamiltonian formalism, which is uh, a canonical formalism, an Hamiltonian formalism for Einstein's field equation, okay? where instead of having second order evolution for the metric, okay, you have the metric and its conjugate momentum in space, gij and pi ij, and you have first order evolution equations, as some of uh, here in the room know very well. And there is a problem when you couple this to a spinning particle, this introduces complication, derivative interaction, how you extend the ADM formalism. The ADM formalism for non-spinning particles is nicely done. For spinning, it's more complicated. Uh, then you need actually to go beyond the, the, the spinning particle model, because in the spinning model, usually you say, I truncate the dynamics at the dipole level. I have monopole dipole. Everything beyond is set to zero, like quadrupole and things like that. But black holes have quadrupole moments and all higher moments. And these quadrupole and higher moments are all computed from the spin. You know, a Kerr solution, it's a rotating black hole, is oblate in a sense. It has a quadrupole moment, quadratic in the spin. It has octupole moments, etc. And you want to include this because for highly spinning uh, black holes, you need this in principle. You have also the problem, <coughs> so you need to include higher spinning things. And then you have the problem of higher order derivatives. Let me remind you, by the way, of something which I remember surprised me a long time ago when I started working in this, and I was reading the book of Plebansky and Infeld, Infeld and Plebansky, in which uh, actually I think they were citing wrong uh, results. Uh, because if you take, uh, uh, which were corrected by Tulchev, I think, uh, if you take the leading order spin orbit acceleration, that is to say the part, uh, you have two spinning particles, you study their interaction at the leading uh, non-relativistic order. And if you use uh, the harmonic gauge, something like a covariant gauge for the, the metric, you find interaction terms like that. Uh, and then you, you want to have uh, a Lagrangian, a canonical description for this. And the surprise is that there does not exist a Lagrangian which depends only on position and velocities from which this derives. If you want to keep this position, you need to introduce a Lagrangian that depends on accelerations, Ostrogratsky Lagrangian, okay? Or you do a, a, a canon, not a canonical, a contact transformation written here. You shift the position variables, uh, and this is the Newton Price Wigner uh, things, to eliminate the acceleration. So it just shows you the subtleties when you have spinning particles. Uh, now let me mention also a very trivial uh, trick, uh, I mean trick, it's a fact, which has been very useful for deriving the dynamics uh, uh, depending on spin at linear in spin order between two bodies. Uh, there is a theorem which is the following, which I will prove for you in one line. The theorem is that if you are interested in the spin interaction, linear in spin between two spinning bodies, it is enough to compute the metric generated by these two bodies without spins, <coughs> so for non-spinning bodies, and from it you are going to compute the spin orbit interaction. And the way you compute it is the following. You say that at leading order in spin, the spin vector of each particle will be parallelly propagated, parallelly propagated in the metric generated by the two bodies, but you, as you are already linear in spin, you can say the metric is computed without spins. So you compute the parallel propagation of the two spin vectors in the field generated by the two things without taking into account spin. And you go, you introduce a phase space of two degrees of freedom. You introduce, the, you describe the spin vectors by a vector on the unit sphere. And then it gives you an equation of motion, which is essentially of the non-relativistic form. The dot of the S vector is omega cross S where you compute omega as function of position and velocities without having taken into account spin interaction. And then next thing, you prove very easily that the Hamiltonian with spin orbit interaction is just the, the non-spinning Hamiltonian plus omega dot s for each body, where omega is the same omega as before, is the uh, angular rotation of each spin vector dotted now in s, 
and you prove that this gives the correct equation of motion, which now includes the effect of spin on the translational uh, degrees of freedom. So it's a very simple thing, but very useful. Uh, I will give examples. Now let me just flash some results uh, which have been obtained over the last years. I mean, many people contributed over uh, many years, but the most recent results have been obtained by uh, Jaranowski and Schaefer and by Levy and Steinhoff. And you get uh, full, uh, you get Hamiltonians which are decomposed in many, you know, post-Newtonian terms for mass and post-Newtonian uh, LO means leading order, NLO means next to leading order, and NNLO means next to next leading order. This is the level that uh, people can do. So at leading order, you have this spin orbit interaction. At next leading order, you have something like that. At next to next leading order, you have again very complicated spin dependent Hamiltonian. And again, therefore, you know, it goes for pages and pages. And therefore, again, now, the effective one body method comes and say, good, we need these complicated results, but now we are going to transform them in a simpler version by again saying, let's invent an effective uh, description for now a particle with spin moving in a metric which will contain also spin effects, like rotational effects, and uh, which will be actually a deformation of the curve metric because we know that <coughs> in the small mass ratio, you should have a particle moving in the, the curve metric is the black hole for, uh, is the rotating black hole discovered by Roy Kerr. Uh, and at the end, you can write, you know, formulas which are more complicated than the uh, very simple metric with A, B I, I gave before, but not so much complicated. You have A, B, P, B, and P, you know, you have just a small augmentation of the number of functions. And the crucial thing is that you have what we call gyro gravito magnetic uh, ratios, which means, you know, L dot S uh, spin couplings. You have two types of spin couplings between the angular moment, orbital angular momentum, L is R cross P. Really, in Hamiltonian mechanics, it's really R cross P. There are no corrections. Uh, dot uh, spin vectors, and there are two spin vectors that come in, the sum of the two spin vectors, and this combination of the two spin vectors, and then all the question is how to compute these coefficients in front of this. One of these two coefficients uh, starts with two, and this is, by the way, the very famous fact that the gyro magnetic ratio of a curved black hole is equal to two, like the uh, Dirac electron, but this too is not exact in the sense that it is corrected by self-field effects and uh, mass ratio effects. And, and you see all this, so this thing is equivalent to the complicated thing I have shown before, okay? So it has condensed the information about the spin orbit coupling in, in these functions that can be further simplified. Let me also mention another technology which has been used which is the technology called cell force, in which you say that you have a particle moving around the black hole, but now you take into account the, the, the self-interaction of the mass of the particle acting back on itself within the background field of the black hole. In, in uh, diagrammatic language, it means one loop with many interactions with the external field. Many people have, uh, this is a very useful technology to compute part of the terms to high, high orders, okay? To end, do I have uh, yes. five minutes? Yes, okay. Uh, let me mention the link between quantum scattering amplitude. So up to now, I said we have an ultra classical problem, which is the problem of the motion of two black holes, how they interact with spin or without spin. And uh, it's, I mean, these objects, you know, have 30 times the mass of the sun, so quantum effects are negligible. But let us now say, yes, but let us use quantum technology to compute this symplectic dynamics, or this Hamiltonian in the usual language. And uh, how can it be done? It can be done first by, instead of discussing, uh, first at the classical level, uh, you can, uh, before, you know, I was talking about the motion of black holes and I was interested in the motion bound states, like elliptic like motion, you know, the two bodies go around and they get closer and closer because they, they lose angular momentum to gravitational waves. 
But now let us discuss a scattering situation where I shoot two particles that interact gravitationally, and then they come out with a different angle than the initial angle. I can compute this angle in perturbation theory, and the advantage, and this was done, by the way, this was done at the one loop level in the 80s. Uh, actually, one of the groups working was uh, Luis Bell, uh, uh, Chus Martin, Jose Ibanez, myself, and Natalie Derwell. Uh, we computed at the time uh, the equations of motion to uh, second order in G. And recently, I understood that these results, and, and uh, Konradin Westphal computed that parallelly, these results are quite useful. They give a different view on the dynamics, which is not post-Newtonian expanded, because post-Newtonian expansion means you assume small v over c. Here, you assume v over c can be order unity. You, know? you have two bodies that go uh, very high velocities, and you get exact results to all orders in v over c. The effective one-body description works and gives very simple results. I will not describe the details. For instance, the full I mean, uh, in the 80s, we had very complicated calculations to uh, compute that. And all this information is, a, is contained in this function, which is a modified mass shell condition for the effective one body. So something simple. What I want to mention is the same idea has been applied recently for spin couplings that we could compute with Donato Bini uh, and then uh, to second order in G. What is the spin? Uh, what we call the spin holonomy, which is the following. Uh, you take two spinning particles that scatter. They come in at minus infinity with some spin vectors in space-time. And at plus infinity, the spins have rotated okay, in space-time. And you want to know what is the integrated rotation between the initial spin and the final spin. That's what we call holonomy in the sense it's the integral of a connection along the full world line. And from this thing, you can compute what is the spin-orbit interaction. And then you get explicit results, which I must say, alas, are more complicated than for the massive particles. But this is the answer, OK? These are the analog of the gyro gravitomagnetic ratio, which was 2 in the non-relativistic approximation. And this 2 is, uh, becomes uh, this plus this, you know? So it's a fun gamma is the Lorentz factor between the two world lines. Uh, quantum. Recently, I mean, first in the past, in the 70s, people had said, maybe we can use quantum Feynman diagrams to compute gravitational interaction. And they did it, but only to lowest order, like 1 pn order. And I will mention in particular the, the work of Barker and company. Uh, where they did that uh, with spinning uh, things. What I want to say is that, in case you are not uh, aware, is that over the last uh, 20 years, there have been a big progress in computing quantum gravitational scattering uh, by discovering new properties of quantum gravity, where essentially, to say a buzz phrase, you discover that gravity is like the square of young mills. But really, technically, that is to say, some gravitational amplitudes are really the tens tensor products of two Young-Mills amplitudes. And this discovery has led to a lot of progress. There are also other techniques. I just show that in the past, OK, uh, Barker had computed something simple. It was just the one graviton exchange between spinning particles, but still, from it, they deduced some potential spin-dependent potential. So it showed conceptually the idea that a quantum scattering computation might give something of classical interest. Uh, recently, there have been, no, I'm going around here. Why it doesn't go? OK. Now, but the problem is the following. If you start from, the, the problem is the, how do you transform, translate a quantum scattering amplitude in an Hamiltonian, OK? The, uh, and, and this is non-trivial because actually uh, the domain of validity of the Born Feynman expansion is exactly the opposite of the domain of validity of the usual uh, weak field expansion in gravity. So you need something subtle to extract classical results from quantum results. But it is possible. 
uh, as I have shown and then other people have shown. I want to mention that there has been a breakthrough a few months ago, although I have my own doubts. As I said in a conference last week, I think the result is finally slightly wrong, okay? which means wrong also. Uh, and uh, uh, Bern, uh, Zvi Bern and, and others uh, have uh, computed for the first time the two-loop amplitude, uh, which, uh, which gives the uh, third post-Minkowskian uh, interaction between two fast-moving uh, bodies. And to finish, I want to say, to come back to the main topic of this conference, is that there seems to be very interesting and still not understood, not fully understood, uh, things, I mean aspects, uh, connecting quantum spinning particles, so quantum scattering of spinning particles, like Dirac particles or high spin particles, and classical rotating black holes. And here I mean the new thing is that it's not, you know, at the leading order, because at the leading order, you can prove that if you use Dirac particles, spin one half, which looks, by the way, absurd. I remember when I first read these papers, they say, how can they deduce from a spin which is h bar over two, you know, which is zero in the classical limit, how can you claim you prove something about the spinning, the spin interaction of two black holes with high spin? Actually, it is correct, okay? You have to understand that there is something universal at the spin h bar of the two. But here we are talking about uh, spinning black holes with high spin, where you want to keep into account all the higher orders in spin. Quadrupole, octupole, hexadecopole, you know? So you need now to have a quantum scattering technology for high spin particles. Not the Dirac equation, but something which can allow very high spin. And recently, in this work of Guevara, Ochirov, Vines, they have found that by special exponentiation techniques of soft factors, it seemed that indeed that leading order, which is one graviton exchange still, you recover all the spin couplings of a curved black hole from uh, a quantum calculation. So it's the beginning, but it shows that there are still mysterious things to be understood about the gravitational interaction of spinning particles. So you can read uh, my summary about this uh, and uh, the main point was that Soryo and Kuzley uh, symplectic approach uh, is, is, is very nice, but has remained uh, essentially unexploited, although I am currently working on uh, showing how it can be exploited beyond what, uh, beyond what has been done up to now. Thank you very much. <laughs>